Can you hear me? Hello, welcome everyone to uh, today's SEO session where I'm going to be chatting with three of the best practitioners in the game. We've got uh, the founder of Backlinko and CEO of Exploding Topics, the top resource to uncover high growth keywords before they start trending. His weekly email newsletter is read by over 170,000 SEO professionals and marketers. Welcome, Brian Dean. He runs Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. He runs growth at Figma. The go-to go collaborative design tool for teams. Big organic traffic to their site has increased 5x since Tony's joined the team in uh, 2018. Thanks for joining us, Tony. How's it going? Nice to meet everybody. Excited to be here. And we have the author of Product-Led SEO and a growth advisor to high-growth high startups like Coinbase, Gusto, Mixpanel, and Quora. He was previously director of growth at SurveyMonkey. Welcome, Eli Schwartz. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, uh, Eli. Let's let's start with you. And and by the way, Eli is uh, tuning in from the airport. Big shout out to, to Eli for, for making it happen. Um, tell us what what is product led SEO and and how can a startup identify it as a viable growth strategy? So uh, the best way to really identify it is to understand what product led SEO is not. So product led SEO is not going onto a keyword tool like SEMrush and identifying the keywords that you want to target and then building content. I know Brian's going to jump on me for this, but really like taking keywords and targeting those keywords and expecting that to be your SEO strategy. So yes, you should absolutely do things like that, but that's not going to lead to once you've reached some sort of stability, that's not going to be 10 X growth. That's going to give you your initial content. Plan. Product led SEO is really thinking about what's the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of pages you can create around your product that create user value that people are going to be searching and discovering and engaging with. So an example, and what I went into my book, Product Led SEO, is Zillow. So Zillow didn't go and say, we're going to write keyword, we're going to write content around mortgage. We're going to write content around real estate. We're going to write content around selling your house. They did. They do have that kind of content. But the bulk of their traffic is really coming from the hundreds of millions of addresses in America. And think about TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor, again, they didn't write blog posts about what it's like to stay in the Waldorf Astoria in New York or what it's like to stay in the Hyatt in Miami. They went and built a structure and an architecture to have a page for every single hotel in the entire world. So that's product led SEO, really thinking about is there a product around what you're doing that will be just for search users? And that's how you lead to the topic of our, our session today, but like many, many, many X growth instead of here's a piece of content. I hope I'm going to build great links. I hope I'm going to compete against everyone else out there. And if not, then what? Thank you. Yeah. And I'm excited to dive in a little bit more to that programmatic uh, approach for sure. Um, Brian, I feel like I've followed you and Backlinko for the better part of a, of a decade now. Um, what are some myths or, or misconceptions that you commonly see that just people just get wrong about it? The biggest one is just creating a bunch of content and saying, that's going to solve all your problems. So what Eli said is 100% right. There are tons of companies that have su succeeded by creating this user-generated content or mass amounts of pages. The secret sauce of those programs were backlinks, that those sites, due to the domain authority, were able to rank those pages. Because on the surface, those pages don't have a lot going for them when they first started. So take a, a TripAdvisor review page. When the ho a new hotel comes out, there's really not much there. Some basic information about the hotel, maybe how much it costs, some availability, but there's no review. There aren't any reviews yet. There's nothing really populated there. And even when it gets some traction, it's just random people writing reviews. Like the, the content's usually kind of crappy. But the key, like Eli's mentioning, is the scale that if you scale it up. But if you just go, okay, I'm going to create a site and make it 100,000 pages you're gonna be in for a world of hurt. Your technical SEO is gonna be a mess. Those pages aren't gonna get indexed and they're definitely not gonna rank. So the number one thing is, yes, content is key, 
but your site needs domain authority for all that other stuff to work. That's the foundation of everything. You take that out and it's just simply not going to work. That's why we're not going to, we don't have any small scale examples of, oh, this tiny site created a hundred thousand pages and now they're ranking that plus, but Eli's strategy plus links is super, super effective. That's the foundation links. Got it. Yeah. Domain authority. Um, I, I definitely want to kind of decouple that into, into its elements. Um, but Tony, I, I would love to hear from you, you know, tell us a story of how you quintupled organic traffic at Figma. Like how did, how did that happen? How did you identify the right levers to pull it and what made the difference? Well, uh, the best SEO hack is, is a product people love. Uh, so I, I can't take credit for that. Um, you know, Figma has insane product market fit and, and as such has, you know, incredible kind of domain authority and a bunch of folks linking to it. Uh, some of the things that I think, uh, we started to do here is move into the world of UGC. Um, if you look like more recently, we have the Figma community where users can now start to create really helpful templates, uh, start to show off their portfolio, uh, publish plugins, that sort of deal, kind of building some structure around that has been critical. Uh, another thing that we've done, which surprises a lot of folks is we've really invested in a lot of engineering content, which may not seem uh, intuitive for a design tool, uh, but that stuff has been linked to from some very powerful and authoritative uh, domains around the web. So really trying to establish Figma as a thought leader uh, even outside of the world of design now and and starting to expand just across all product teams. And, and when you talk about uh, domain authorities coming up again, like how how do you, uh, what was a product that people love the primary driver of creating that domain authority or like what, what moved the needle on that? Sure. I mean, uh, you know, startups are all about speed and prioritization. And, you know, you often don't have like the luxury of a very strong domain to start. Um, initially a lot of what I was focused on was building, like, you know, standing up a bunch of pages, building a content writer, uh, you know, production line, um, trying early on really to kind of get, uh, some footing with Figma. But once, once Figma found its footing, the strategy very quickly shifted toward, okay, now we have this happening organically. How can we start to build structure around this? How can we start to silo this? Um, and I think that's been a big focus of ours, uh, like with the community. You're starting to see us shift our strategy a little bit from, you know, trying to drive traffic to specific pages where we create content to promoting, you know, the amazing content that our community creates. And, and Eli, does that does that match up with kind of the product led SEO approach that that you know to be successful? And like, what would you add to that? So I, I don't know that it really does match up with what I would consider product-led SEO. So product-led SEO in this case, and I, I know Figma users would never be able to do this, but like if Figma users were creating content and distributing it online, and that would be drawing in what Figma does. So you're essentially finding it in the process of discovery and awareness and then eventual conversion funnel. So, you know, from that respect, I think you do need to find some aspect that's not private that people could get introduced to Figma. Like I know I was introduced to Figma by my clients. They're like, hey, here's what we're building. Rather than me just trolling on the web for like interesting ideas and then wanting to build something from it. Like Canva does that. Like you often discover things on Canva because you're like, hey, I, I want a, a good slide presentation or I, I need a good business card design or I need a wedding invitation. There's Canva showing you someone else's wedding invitation and then you go through that funnel and you build for yourself. So. With Figma, I'm sure there is something out there that would drive that, but really building content around what the product does, that's essential SEO and that's what you should do. But like the unlocking millions and millions of pages, that's a bit more of a challenge. And, and that's why startups really don't gravitate towards it because you have to invest in that kind of thing. You have to build entire teams around it. And like, that's what I do with my clients once they're more mature, which is, hey, we've already built out all this content. Now can we create some sort of scalable way that people just find the content and it's long tail, right? You don't do keyword research for it because there is no keyword research for it. It's really about, are users going to find this? It's exactly like what Zillow did. You can't do keyword research on people's personal addresses that might get three searches per year or no searches per year. But when that address becomes popular, then that gets searches. So you don't know what's popular. You're building out that entire product to really like throw out that like net in the web and let people get caught in it. 
Eli, there's actually, um, that's a great point. And uh, it's a relatively new product. But if you go to figma.com now backslash C, uh, you can't find things like wedding invites yet. Uh, but you can find things like presentation templates that our community has created, or wireframe kits, or, you know, mobile app templates, we're starting to uh, expand, obviously, design centric first. Uh, but we now have, you know, people creating things even like uh, Animal Crossing makers, um, or just kind of very interesting and fun use cases on Figma, and we're starting to rank now for all sorts of stuff. So uh, check out if you're in the audience, check out the Figma community. It's backslash C, but uh, there is now a, a wealth of templates being created from uh, people internally and and our community externally that are starting to publish this stuff. That's awesome. I mean, that is absolutely a growth lever like that. You can't do that as a startup because you need millions of users to do that for you. Totally. So you need to reach some sort of scale and then it happens. That's all. Oh man. But yeah, you got you got my mind running of uh, you know how ways ways that we can we can replicate that. Um and super cool to 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 kind of be a fly on the wall and see y'all brainstorming this in real time. Um Brian, I'm I'm curious, you know, uh, we talk a lot about like on page SEO, off page SEO. How has the ratio sort of changed over the years? And, and is one becoming increasingly more important than another? I would say it's about the same. If anything, off-page SEO has got a little more important just because on-page SEO has become more simplified. Like it used to make a huge difference if you had your target keyword in H2 tag, for example. That was like a huge deal. Now it doesn't matter really at all. Um, it mattered if you had your keyword in specific places on the page. Now it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, there's even, we ran a big correlation study a couple of years ago of about 12 million Google search results. And we had trouble correlating, finding a correlation between having a keyword in the title tag and ranking for that term. Oh, wow. So that, and that's supposed to be the holy grail of SEO. Right. Like if you don't have the, that in your title tag, you're done, you have no chance of ranking for that keyword. Not so. So Google's just becoming much smarter at interpreting what page is all about and delivering it to people with the right search. Now I still practice these old school on page SEO things. I make sure I have my keyword in my intro. I make sure I have it in the title tag. I make sure I have in the URL and I recommend you do the same. But if you're looking at the trend, it's trending towards Google being able to see a page and say, you know what? This page is about X. And if someone searches for X, we're going to give it to them, even if that person messed up their on-page SEO. So for me, if anything, off-page SEO has become a little bit more important just because on-page SEO is becoming simpler and it's becoming more of a user experience game. The only added complicated part to on-page SEO is this thing called search intent, which we didn't have to worry about a couple of years ago. And that's basically, does your page give searches what they want? It has nothing to do with keywords. It's literally like, can we create a page that makes the user say, yes, this gave me exactly what I want, whether it's a Zillow listing or a Figma template, it's giving users what they want. It has nothing to do with on-page SEO in the keyword stuffing sense. It's a whole new paradigm. So that's added a little bit of complicated, add a little bit of intrigue to the space, but it's not necessarily on-page SEO in that keyword sense. But to me, it's actually more important than keyword research because, and on-page SEO, because if you don't have search intent, it doesn't matter how optimize your pages, it'll never rank. And as a story, a couple of years ago, I learned this the hard way. There was a keyword that I wanted to rank for called backlink checker. That was the keyword. And I was like, yeah, this is perfect. People search for backlink checker. They're going to find backlinko and they're going to sign up for my newsletter and, and buy my courses and stuff. So I was like, how can I, I don't have a backlink checker. So how can I create a post around that? And we analyzed a bunch of different SEO tools to see which ones found the most backlinks for a URL. So we compared Moz, SEMrush, and Ahrefs. And we also built links to Backlinko from other sites that I, I own and found and saw which one could find it first. So it's kind of a race to find the link. And we published the post. It did really well. It got shared. It got tons of comments. People linked to it to prove like Moz was the best on one category. And they were very excited and shared it everywhere. And it never ranked. Because if you look at the results for backlink checker, they're all backlink checkers. That's what people want. <laughs> so no matter how well optimized that page is, no matter how many links I get, it'll never rank in a million years. So I was like, no, I can beat. I kind of, I knew that, but I was like, if you do X, Y, and Z, you can overcome search intent. Not so. Um, if you don't nail search intent, it's never, that page will never rank. So I have a page that's probably will forever be on page two or three of Google, no matter what happens in the future. 
Yeah, yeah, this is why I share the board of Brian saying like the extra part of off-page SEO is building a brand. So, you know, that that's exactly what off-page SEO does. It helps Google understand that you are the brand, that Figma is the brand that people are looking for when they look for those kinds of templates. So it doesn't have to be the best kinds of links. And, and that's the interesting thing. Like when it comes to like raw domain authority, I think that's a metric people focus on way too much. So when I was at SurveyMonkey on three occasions, we got links from whitehouse.gov and ne none of those times did it do anything measurable because it wasn't relevant. Two of the times was because the Trump White House took blog posts that SurveyMonkey had written and just straight up ripped them off, but there were links in there. So they didn't do anything because contextually, Google's like, no one reads the White House blog. No one wakes up in the morning and is like, I'm going to read the White House blog. This is my source of news. Not even the media reads the White House blog. I don't even know why they have a White House blog, right? So like Google's like, that is, it's a high domain authority, but it's not relevant and doesn't really lend authority and brand to the page that's being linked. So the off-page SEO is really not about like, you know, some of the tactics people do nowadays, like guest posting on high domain authority pages. Like it doesn't matter if you're not getting relevant links that help really show Google that you're the brand. And that is how you meet search intent. And I've seen that over and over, just like Brian said, we're like, you deserve to rank based on metrics that we know about, but you don't rank because you're not the right fit. Tony, it seemed like you wanted to jump in with something. Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo Brian's points on intent being such a big deal. And I think one thing that's kind of interesting to me is, is SEOs typically don't like talk to users enough, you might look through search and try and classify intent yourself based on, I don't know, a certain keyword or query you want to rank for. But understanding why and where users are looking for a product or a certain job to be done, I think is very important and something people don't do enough. You know, spend less time in Ahrefs and more time talking to your customers. That's kind of, uh, I think, a big takeaway for a lot of newer SEOs or, or even people who yeah, you can miss the forest for the trees that way. So intent is intent is huge. Digging into that a little bit around search intent, um, you know, another thing that has sort of popped up is like, what type of content is someone actually searching for? Are they looking for an article or to Brian's point, are they looking for a tool? Um, you know, Brian, you spend a lot of time focusing on YouTube these days. How has uh, sort of people looking for videos, how, how is that like factored into the way that you uh, are structuring your, your growth strategy with YouTube? It's actually not because mm -hmm. most, I, what I learned, one of the surprising lessons I learned from YouTube is that YouTube search is considered the second biggest search engine. It may or may not be depending on the source that you use, but it's still tiny. Most people discover videos on YouTube from suggestions of some kind, especially lately. When I first got into YouTube, which was 2013, there were a lot of people doing searches on YouTube. Still do, but much less than before because when you went to the YouTube homepage, it wasn't personalized. It was just random videos that were popular at the time. So it was like, dude, perfect, cute cat videos, whatever. So you'd go to the homepage and you'd kind of have banner blindness to it and then you'd type in the search bar what you actually wanted. Now the recommendations are insanely accurate. Like I get recommendations. I've been in like a like a retro gaming kick lately watching these old like nintendo 64 videos sega saturn stuff and they're they're showing me videos that have like 200 views but they know i would like it so they're able to figure out from this small sample size that i want it and that's how i'm finding it i'm not searching for like sony playstation one videos in search ne not once have i done that and i've watched dozens of them um so in terms of search youtube is is like very overrated like i ranked for a while this year, I don't know if I still do, I haven't checked. I was number one on YouTube for SEO. And you probably think, man, you must be getting crazy amounts of views. <laughs> no, not really. It gets a decent amount of searches, but even for that video, most of its, its views come from suggested video, either in the sidebar next to the video or on the homepage, which is called browse features. So yeah, I think YouTube search, it's nice. And I used to be like, yeah, ranking all the, you know, I rank all my videos for keywords and then they wouldn't get views and then have this random one doesn't rank for everything and anything and it would get tons of views. It's because YouTube was suggesting it to people in browse features, which is the homepage. That's really the key now. It's even less about the suggested video. It's all about the homepage because people are treating it like Netflix now. They're going to YouTube just without any reason, like any, they're just browsing. They're not looking for a specific video. They're just bored. Um, and yeah, so it has an effect in my strategy in that sense. So I just try to create videos that 
are likely to get suggested and people are likely to click on it versus trying to rank for any particular keyword. So yeah, digging into that a bit, like how do you actually optimize for discoverability on, on YouTube? If yeah, that actually was counterintuitive, I didn't realize that YouTube search is overrated in that way. Yeah, I mean, that's from my experience and other channels I've worked with. I would say I'm even, in, in B2B stuff, you get actually more searches than most because we're B2B people. We're like, we want like a CRM, you know, reviews or something. So we're searching for these keywords. Most people on YouTube are just B2C browsing, looking for stuff. They just hop on the, they probably never haven't done a search in months or maybe they do like five searches a month on YouTube. So the key is really to optimize around popular topics. So it's like you actually want to go after competitive keywords on YouTube because that's more likely to get you into that flywheel of people watching it. Like if you go over this niche topic and you, it's good for keyword research, niche topic, rank number one in YouTube, in theory, you should be set because the keyword's not competitive. The problem is no one's searching for that. So if you go after competitive keywords, you're more likely to be the video they suggest after someone watches the PewDiePie video or the huge, you know, huge channel video, you can be next on the list or 10th on the list or whatever. But if you go after these niche topics that are really like tiny, that, that has no competition, it's very unlikely you're going to get suggested. And if you do, it's only going to get suggested to a small number of people. Yeah, very counterintuitive. Did not did not think about going going after competitive keywords. It's typically like not uh, not what I would I would think is. Um, okay, how do you think about writing content for search engines versus? I think we lost him. Yep, am I back? You're back. Yeah, you're All back. Right. Yeah, yeah, sorry to, about that. I wanted to add one more thing on YouTube. Yeah, Tony, go for that's it. That's a that's a big channel for us. And um, I think Brian's uh, insight kind of echo how we feel about it. Um, I will say for, for YouTube, kind of the most important thing is, from my perspective, is to really invest in brand and try and drive subscriber growth because truly folks are just going on there to hang out. Um, I'll also say just purely from like an SEO lens, the thing that we obsess over is like feature zero cards or when the SERP actually returns a video in line. Uh, so those are the things that we're really trying to chase um, or we'll occasionally try and create pages uh, where, we'll, where we'll embed a video at the top. So we might be driving organic traffic for that query, but really like our goal is to try and get you on our YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, in particular, we're thinking a lot about this through the lens of like tutorials or learning design uh, which tend to be pretty competitive, but uh, we obviously have, you know, kind of a unique advantage on the brand side uh, to build subscribers there. So uh, I'm still very bullish on on YouTube, uh, but definitely not, uh, yeah, through traditional through traditional YouTube search. Um, so for what it's worth, just wanted to chime in on that because YouTube is on my mind a lot uh, these days. Yeah, I just want to drop something that may be helpful for the listeners or, or watchers, really. Um, I have a client in the wellness space, and this is the first time I've ever felt that Google is doing something that is monopolistic. I know a lot of people say Google does monopolistic things and evil, and like, you know, they build a better maps product. So they, we want better, like, we're not going to MapQuest. We're not going to Bing Maps and Apple Maps and search. But the one place I've seen them, and I think it's monopolistic in my opinion, is on certain kind of searches, you'll get three pages of Google search, not, not YouTube search, but Google search of videos. And this mm -hmm. client, they had great content, the great content used to rank, but now Google's putting their own YouTube content in there, which they're obviously monetizing. So I know Google's talking to Vimeo and Twitch about getting more videos into search, potentially, so they could say, when antitrust does come for them, they could say, hey, we do video search. <laughs> it's not just YouTube, but right now it is just YouTube. So this client, and this is where it may be helpful for the watchers today and the future watchers, which is... I didn't recommend to my client that they start putting all their money in YouTube because now they can put all their, their efforts into YouTube and they're not necessarily going to rank on Google. They're giving away, they're going to end up giving away their content for free, which may not get any visibility. So all the content they used to gate and sell to put on YouTube, maybe they'll get a little bit of monetization off of it, but nothing compared to what they had. So, you know, it, that kind of sucks, right? It sucks that Google's taken over the search landscape, but I don't think you fight it by stooping down and giving away all your content for free like Google potentially wants them to do. Is that where you see things going, Brian? Uh, not, I don't, I agree with the sentiment that they're, 
obviously looking out for, I mean, YouTube has been dominating the search results for a long time and it's gotten worse. It used to be that you could have your video sitemap. Do you guys remember that Yoast had the video? Everyone's like, I need to get my video sitemap. And I, I got some videos that ranked on there that were Wistia videos and I was blown away. It was like being famous. It was like the little video of mine was in the search results. It was amazing. Then they kind of shut that off and it's been YouTube almost a hundred percent since then. But I don't, I think that YouTube is a really untapped channel. I still think it's super untapped. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't look at it as giving away your content for free the same way you write a blog post. You're not giving away your content for free. I see it the same way. Um, the rub is that you are giving it to YouTube on their platform, but the upside is huge. It's literally a platform that promotes your videos for free and then they pay you when people watch them. So you cover all your costs on the video if you choose to monetize. So for me, the platform still has a ton of potential. It's not for everybody and there are downsides to it. The biggest downside is you're not going to get any traffic from YouTube. I don't know if you've seen that, Tony. You're going to be like, I got a bajillion views. Well, how many people actually clicked on a link and went to Figma? Maybe like 10. It doesn't, even if you got a million visitors a month, I would say if you got 100 visitors from YouTube from clicking, that would be like an insanely high click-through rate. Like we're talking 0% click through rate. It's all top of the funnel awareness and you can't, you'll never be able to tie a string between my YouTube views and money or sales or leads or traffic or anything. But what you do know is how many unique people view your videos. And if you're, you know, like for example, the Backlinko channel, I don't do that much with it anymore, but I still get like 200,000 unique people, not just views, people see my videos every month. Like that is huge. That's my target audience. 200,000 people are seeing me say blah, 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 blah. And they're, it's getting in their mind. Oh, this guy's an SEO expert. And you can do the same thing for big brands too. So for me, the YouTube is still has a huge amount of potential. As long as you know, it's like a TV ad. You can't measure it. You just got to throw it out there and say, what's the downside of having 200,000, 500,000, a million people a month see our stuff and see our brand? There really isn't one. I think, I think uh, brand awareness is definitely the right way to think about it. Um, there are some things we're trying to do to gamify uh, getting folks off YouTube back into the platform, like giving away interactive prototypes. Um, but that's kind of a, a product advantage that we're trying to take it, you know, uh, use to the utmost. Not everybody has a tool that's able to do that, but brand awareness, not my favorite thing. It's not what I wake up in the morning trying to move, but uh, is valuable for sure. Yeah, it, it's valuable. And I have two minds about it, honestly, because if you think about who here has heard of Blockbuster, <laughs> they have amazing brand awareness. We've all heard of them. They're out of business. Um, how about Borders Books, Bookstore? Like there's a lot of brand Enron. Enron has amazing brand awareness. Everyone has heard of them. So for me, I think there's value in it. But I'm also like, I wanted to throw that out there. That's, that's a potential downside that it's only that that if you're able to create a funnel out of it, which I've seen some people do, Tony, I think you guys could do great with that. I've seen guru guys at the end of a video saying like, you know, I it's eight ways to do something. If you want to see the best call to action, go to this page. And people are motivated enough to get off of YouTube and do it. There's potential for that. I've never really been able to crack that nut. I've been sort of just trying to make it a brand awareness thing. So I think there's value in it, but it's not like a slam dunk. I personally am very bullish on it. I think the, it's valuable, but there's that downside. If you're going to put all this effort into it, the brand awareness may ju just be that. Switching gears a little bit, let's let's uh, let's take a hypothetical situation here, and uh, I'm curious to to hear how each of you would approach it. It sounds like yeah, the, the three of you would have very different uh, approaches to to the problem here. So let's say you're starting over from scratch. I just went on Namecheap. I, I, I bought a domain. Uh, you know, no topic authority. Uh, um, it's a B two B company, and um, I've got to, I've got to uh, concentrate my efforts in the first ninety days um, to to uh, get the most get the most bang for my my buck, my time. Um, how should I go about it? What what does the first ninety days actually look like? A any of you who who has some strong inclinations can go ahead and jump in. Don't do SEO. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, I, I'm always frustrated when I, I talk to startups and they're like, you know, I'll talk to a CMO of a startup and they, they say, okay, I'll, we need to talk about SEO because like, I want to check SEO off my list. And they're like, 
well, this we're done. You don't need to check SEO off the list. It's it's nothing's going to happen in 90 days. You know, especially my approach with if you're doing product led SEO, that's 18 months to two years. And startups don't have 18 months to two years. They they just raised money. They need, or maybe they haven't raised any money. But, you know, they just registered the domain. They don't have that time. So I would say take all the money they're thinking about spending in SEO and just put it on paid Facebook and paid Google. And that's how you're going to drive revenue and cash flow. And then start thinking about the strategy you want to build on SEO when you actually have some breathing room and you have 18 months, you have two years to wait out and build that SEO strategy. If you're going to build like blog content, even blog content, you're not going to get the links fast enough. You're not going to get anything fast enough that any of it's going to rank and justify the investment you made. So I always say just pour it all in paid marketing and it really depends on the business for B2B. I almost never think B2B companies should really be spending on SEO. Like the example Tony gave around wedding invitations, you know, that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of consumers there, but from a business perspective, Figma has competition. And in many cases, before people make a buy, they're aware of the competition. So it's not necessarily an attributed SEO conversion. And, you know, my favorite example uh, of B2B not being a fit for SEO was I talked to Google Cloud probably about three years ago. They were really, really focused. I was interviewing, really focused on hiring someone to help out with SEO at Google Cloud. You know, we all know what Google Cloud is. And I was like, why do you want SEO? Like, no one's going to Google Google Cloud or like cloud tools and say, oh, wow, I, look, Google's number one on Google. Let me just get my CIO here and see if he has a big enough Amex or, you know, and she's just, or, you know, she's just going to throw down and get an RFP from Google because Google's number one. Like anybody doing that kind of buy is going to say like, okay, it's Google, it's Microsoft, it's Amazon. Now we choose not, it's not about who's ranked first. And that's what I think happens in B2B. Again, depends on B2B. Like obviously I was at SurveyMonkey, that was a cheap conversion. So yes, it's, it's B2B, but it's also sort of B2C. But anything that's like really expensive B2B, and I've worked for multiple companies where the end of the sale is a handshake, you could never attribute that to SEO. So they're going to put tons of money in it and be like, it didn't work. Well, it did. You had visibility, you created awareness. Someone else signed up and saw a demo. Someone else talked to a salesperson. And then months down the road, biz dev or legal went and engaged. And you'll have no idea how that started. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. It's like, hey, don't do not do SEO in the, in the first 90 days. Uh, perhaps a slight re reframing of the question would be you have 18 months of runway um, and uh, you have, have a little bit of bandwidth to be able to allocate. Um, Tony or, or Brian, feel free to hop in. How would you go about it? Go ahead, Tony. Brian, I actually think I'm probably somewhere between you and Eli on this, if I were to guess, on, this, on the spectrum. I, I think I generally agree, like, uh, it's very hard for startups to find their footing um, with SEO early on, especially if you have no authority. So like a couple of tactical tips that I recommend for early stage companies is if you've raised money, uh, hit up all of your initial investors to get some backlinks and then hit them up for any relevant portfolio companies that you can do branded content with. Uh, something I did at my last role to kind of bootstrap our SEO is really focus on trying to find winners in their portfolio who, who were successful and working with them to do co-branded content. And essentially the ask was pretty straightforward. I'll do 80, 90% of the work. Um, we can publish it on your domain. We'll do lead sharing. Uh, I get a backlink out of it and I get to kind of like grow brand awareness and share leads with a, a more successful brand. Um, I think generally early stage, I wouldn't do any like uh, informational um, type of SEO projects. I think I would keep it pretty scoped to things like use case pages, um, that sort of stuff. Uh, I would also maybe spend a little bit on paid uh, SEM just to learn and understand what converts to uh, a paid user. So, you know, in the case of like a wedding invite, eventually at some point uh, down the road, there will probably be things probably be things like wedding invites on the Figma community, but uh, a professional designer is probably not going to convert from Sketch or XD to Figma for a wedding invite. They will uh, much more likely convert for something like, a, uh, you know, a wireframe template, for example. So I think um, that's kind of how I would structure it is I would sprinkle just a little bit of money on, on paid on the keywords that I think would convert well. Um, 
and then I would know where to make my investments like on the SEO side. But I, I would place probably very few bets early on and focus on kind of like growing authority uh, and yeah, and and looking for, for other channels uh, initially, I think. Yeah, I mean, I... I... Like you said, Tony, I'm kind of in between you guys. At first, you know, Eli, it sounds like blasphemy on the SEO uh, dinner <laughs> table to say don't do it. And it's like Lord, a Jedi mind trick. <laughs> like, don't it. do it. But he's 100% right that if you want results in 90 days, SEO is not the channel for you at all. Um, but the, the problem is if you don't get started, it's SEO is one of those things that you look back on. And you're always like, oh, I wish I started sooner. If you talk to companies that are succeeding with, with SEO, they'll always say the same thing. We should have started sooner. We should have started sooner. That's now. So if you get started now, when in a year down the road, 18 months down the road, two years down the road, when you start to get traction, you're going to be like, man, I'm really glad we didn't kick the can down the road and say, oh, we'll start SEO when we're ready. And I can actually give a case study of this because I was in the exact this exact same situation uh, with a new domain about two years ago. And I, we're able to grow the organic traffic to exploding topics. Now we're getting 100,000 visitors a month. And this time last year, we're getting like to the blog, maybe like 5,000. So we've really been able to like almost 20x our organic traffic over the last year. But it's one of those things where we started the year before that and we're just starting to reap the benefits now. So what we did, the number one thing, which I'm 100% I'm with Tony on this one, don't just start creating a bunch of content. You need to create something that people will link to. So if you're bootstrapped and not funded, how do you do that? Well, what we did is we created something that was publicly valuable is what we call it. We need to come up with a cool name like product-led SEO. We call it tool SEO. It's basically a cool tool that's valuable on its own that people will naturally share and link to without you needing to twist people's arms and send a bunch of outreach emails and send 10 outreach emails to remind people of bumping on top of the inbox. None of that stuff. Just this is the thing that people naturally want to link to. So in our case, it was basically a small database at the time. It was only like maybe 400 trends that you could, you could search by different dates and um, categories and things like that. Now it's 10,000 trends. We have a paid plan and all that stuff. But when it first started, it was really simple. It's something that you could put together in like a week if you're a good developer. Um, so we launched that on Product Hunt. It was number one product of the month on Product Hunt. That was bigger than anything. Like that alone was massive. That got us on the radar screens of so many people. I think we got 30,000 visitors from Product Hunt. Uh, of the course couple of months because it's not just that day they promote you all the time to people that are coming on the platform you start to get and they're suggested so the number one thing i would do is create basically a product it's kind of like product-led marketing where you take a piece of your product and you make it free and put it on the outside and that's a unique opportunity that SaaS businesses have that like a plumber doesn't like a plumber just has to create his plumber website here are my plumber services and here's how you call me and here are the hours and whatnot a SaaS company can say, here's this cool resource that you can actually use and share, and it's valuable. So to us, that was massive. Because if you could go back, go back and archive.org and look at explodingtopics.com, you're going to say, that's it. That was, what, yes, that was it. It was massively successful. Uh, part of it was promoting like crazy uh, that day, that product hunt day, hitting up everyone. I probably hit you up, Eli. Anyone that I even remotely was familiar with in the marketing community, I was like, can you please, you know, give us an up forward on Product Hunt? And it, that was huge. We also had some small wins. We're getting featured in newsletters and stuff. But for the most part, that's what I'd start with because that builds your authority, both in terms of brand and domain authority in terms of links. Then from there, like Tony said, I'd be really focusing on these niche, 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 long tail keywords that customers you are positive are searching for. Um, and you can do paid ads if you're not sure, but you definitely, this isn't the time to be doing like informational top of the funnel, you know, they might convert, they might not type of thing. Cause those things are great. That's where you're going to get the majority of your traffic down the road, but starting out, you want to get some money in from this organic traffic. So, uh, yeah, that's basically what we did is we created the, the tool. We promoted the crap out of it. We started creating blog posts that we know our target audience who are basically VCs and investors are searching for. And now we're sort of expanding out and scaling up. And that's worked really well. Like I said, we've had like a massive increase in organic traffic and last month was our best month. And it all started with that tool. If we didn't have that, it probably wouldn't have uh, worked. And just to echo something Brian was saying, so Brian knew what was going to work because he, he knew what the community wanted. 
And one thing I find a lot with like newer domains and, and you know, certainly VC funded startups that are just getting started, they don't know what's going to work. So they come up with this idea of like, this is what I need to build SEO on. And they could be wrong. Whereas like, if you do some other marketing, you do some paid marketing, you'll know what converts, what kind of user you want. The guy was talking to, I'll change some details, but it was a startup in the insurance space. And they came to me, they wanted to rank, they wanted to do SEO. And I pointed out they were never going to rank on the keyword they wanted, like car insurance as an example. If you Google car insurance, it's Geico. Geico has been around as Google and Progress has been around as Google. Like there's not a chance they're going to rank on that. They're not just gonna be like, hey, we raised a billion dollars from SoftBank, Google, could you give us some love? Like that's not happening. So then I talked, they were already doing some paid marketing. I talked to them about their angle on paid marketing. And they said it was people that had prior issues with driving, let's say drunk driving or some felonies, that's who converted the most. So I said, why would you not build SEO around that? Why are you going to go and just do all this car insurance stuff? So like, if you've done some other marketing, especially paid marketing, which has instant gratification behind it, you'll convert pretty quickly. Then you learn, then you know who your best converting customers. So now you could say like, hey, my CAC for paid is this. What if I took the same investment and I put it into SEO? Obviously you're not doing CAC for SEO. It's more like, if I put this investment in X amount of clicks I would have gotten unpaid, can I eventually, 18 months to 24 months, pay that back? Absolutely. But you should know that that customer will work for you. Like these guys, they just want to build a bunch of content around car insurance and build backlinks for car insurance. And even if had it been successful, it wouldn't have worked because that wasn't their sweet spot. And is that kind of like how you would think about a minimum viable SEO strategy for someone who is just, uh, you know, starting out essentially is really identify, hey, what are those high converting niche keywords, perhaps via, you know, paid ads um, to really identify some of those things. Um, but yeah, how, how is that? Is that what, what you would say for a minimum viable SEO strategy? Yes, for you, it's customized, right? Like, what is your product market fit in general? And that's what you should really build around. And I think that's a mistake many people make when it comes to SEO is they divorce the whole channel from the rest of their marketing. So when it comes to paid marketing, they don't want to just like be number one on Google. That does makes no sense. Why would you bid to be number one? You want to go after a certain user. You don't want to show your ad to everyone on Facebook. You, you have very advanced targeting. They know that. But when it comes to SEO, they're just like, well, I looked at SEMrush or Ahrefs and like, that's a popular keyword. I'm going to create content around it without really thinking through like, Who's the audience and what's the keyword that audience would look for? So yes, absolutely. You do need that minimum viable SEO. Yeah, these are both great points. In particular, the tooling idea is a great one. Um, I see some good comments kind of happening in the chat. But uh, to Eli's point, kind of what we refer to this as is like query product fit. Um, so, you know, does the, uh, does the query actually fit the product? There's a lot of things that Figma can rank for now because it's a very authoritative domain. Uh, but is that like our core audience? Will that person convert to a paid user? Will they, ex will they share whatever we're giving them with their team? Um, you know, and if it doesn't fit within that framework, then we're not going to pursue it. would love to hear from from each of you what what does your seo stack look like everybody loves to hear you know what what tools are people using like what are the things you recommend would love to hear uh um uh, yeah starting with you tony you know what what's your stack yeah um honestly most most of what we do is within hrs and mode um so you know looking doing our analysis in mode and then uh initial keyword research in uh hrs i think um uh, ClearScope is a great tool that I've used as well on the content side. Um, for technical SEO, um, we've used like some pre-rendering tools. Pre-render.io is a very good one. Um, but we're pretty lean on, on tooling um, in terms of like, yeah, our SEO stack. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I use SEMrush and Ahrefs mostly, and I used to be, and I also use ClearScope. It's solid. Uh, I've tried a bunch of competitors, and I'm sure they have more advanced stuff, but ClearScope is just simple, which is good for me. Um, so, yeah, I'm also like Tony. I'm not using as many tools as I used to. Like I used to, I mean, I once reviewed 200 SEO tools as part oh, of wow. a blog post. Now, this was not for fun. This was actually torture, um, and you can imagine all the free trials I had to sign up for and charges I had, it was insane. But I reviewed them all and I came to the conclusion that there aren't that many that do anything unique. Like the reason that Ahrefs is valuable or SEMrush is valuable is not because they have some amazing features, it's that they're all in one. 
that you don't need to log into 10 tools. It's all integrated. So for me, I'm trying to think of tools that I use for SEO. It's really just those two. I really just use Ahrefs and SEMrush 99% of the time. So I, I use SEMrush for basic research, but really everything I do is around user research. So I would throw out that everyone should check out Google Consumer Surveys. I forget what they charge right now per user. Like I'm working with a client right now. They're really all over the place. And I wanted to help them narrow down who they should target as they invest in SEO. And they wanted to use Search Console, which by the way, I love Google Search Console. Um, use the API, you'll get great data from it. So they want to use Search Console and some of their existing data. And essentially that was a feedback loop that they shouldn't rely on because it's biased. They're gonna assume their best customer is what already ranks instead of looking at data around who their best customer potentially is. So either you could survey your own customers, which they didn't want to do, or you could use Google Consumer Surveys and really like survey people out there that are in your audience and ask them what they want. And then from there, build on that. And because like I'm a big proponent to building massive sites, I think you need a cloud crawler. So I love on crawl for that. Like if you don't or don't have a massive site, I don't think you need a cloud crawler. If you have a million pages, you absolutely need a cloud crawler to really understand what your site looks like. So I'm gonna echo the SEMrush there. And I do a ton of like just Google searches to find weird queries people are looking for and then validating that there's potentially an audience, again, humans behind it, not just search queries. And for that, like, I'll even like dig into Reddit and Quora and see the kinds of things people are asking. And then you can expand on those topics, validating with Google consumer surveys, validating with test pieces of content. And then when you, you kind of hit it and that light bulb goes off, build a massive programmatic site and use OnCrawl to really identify where your issues are from there. In the in our final minutes, I'll do some rapid fire uh, questions here. We've we've got so many. Um, uh, Brian, how do you pump out your content? You know your your team, your personal writing process. Uh, it seems like seems like people are pretty curious about how how you do that. So the key is first of all I, two things. There's the personal level where I write every word myself and don't outsource writing, which has is limits you how much you can put out, but it maintains a quality standard. That's important to me. So the number one thing is this, uh, Paul Graham essay called maker time versus manager time. And I use that approach for writing that writing is something your brain hates doing in general. Um, so if you start your day on social media and email, it's really hard to pull it back to writing because it's gotten this dopamine fix and it just goes wild. So for me, the number one thing is first thing I do work-wise is always writing. I open a Google Doc, I usually have something drafted and I start writing. That can only really take me so far, I've learned. And the, over the last two years, I've scaled up content ridiculously. And the number one thing I've done is make it like a little assembly line for every piece of content. Because I used to think that writing a blog post was writing a post, adding screenshots, editing it, putting it into WordPress, um, creating the visuals, getting everything set up for social media, writing the newsletter, getting it scheduled. But really writing the blog post is just writing the blog post. That's really all I need to do. Like that's my own, I'm not necessarily good at like writing social media posts or editing or putting stuff into the email service provider and sending it out. Like I'm not good at that. Like I'm bad at that actually. Screenshots, we have a graphic designer who, took them to the 10 levels above what I was doing. And those were very time consuming. So now I literally, all I need to do is write. So what I recommend doing is taking your current process and breaking it down into tiny little steps, as small as you can, and thinking, can we eliminate some of those steps or can I have someone help? So if we had like a writing org chart, it used to be Brian at the top, Brian doing all this stuff. And now I just write and we have three people that help me actually execute that and put it into practice, which has been huge. Um, I realized that almost half the time I was spending on non-writing, writing tasks. So yeah, that's been a game changer is getting help um, for those other things. It's so simple, um, yet, yet it's it's just something that people just don't do. I mean, I'm just thinking the way that I wake up in the morning, I go and grab my phone and I've got all my notifications. I can immediately feel that filling my my brain space uh, before I can actually do any creative work. Definitely can relate. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, we're unfortunately kind of running out of time here. would love to hear from, from each of you kind of what, what you're up to and how people can get in touch. Um, Eli, why don't, why don't we start with you? So I love working with companies that have ideas 
or have the potential for product led SEO and, and then sharing with them the opportunities and helping them to build it. And I'd say like probably two thirds of the conversations I take, I, I tell them just do paid marketing or build content SEO and, and echoing what, what was said earlier about clear scope. Like if you want to build basic content and you don't want to do product led SEO, you just need tools. You don't need like an SEO. I know it's, it's blasphemous here, but I don't think you need an SEO consultant. You just need like a smart product person or a smart writer and that's your SEO. And you can get in touch with me, obviously check out my book, Product Led SEO, it's on Amazon. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, blog is at elishwartz.co or productledseo.com or find me on Twitter at 5LE. Uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to Patrick Herber in the chat. The guy is a monster. Link <laughs> providing monster. Like, thank you, Patrick. It's been like it's, that every session, Brian. Every session, Patrick has been on there, like dropping notes and like it's it's been like that for the last two days. It's been awesome. It's amazing because it's really it's really difficult to understand. Like during this conversation, we're just throwing words out there so fast it can be hard to keep up. And Patrick's providing all this, all the links and the additional context, which is really helpful. So shout out to Patrick. Um, yeah, I'm Brian Dean. You can find me at backlinko.com. I also have a startup called Exploding Topics where we um, uncover topics before they take off. The best place to probably follow me is my newsletter. If you go to backlinko.com, there's a form there. You can sign up for the email list and I send out tons of exclusive SEO strategies that I only share with email subscribers. Tony, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> Um, so I'm Tony. I work on the growth team at Figma. Um, we are hiring. There's two Figma backslash C's you should check out the community, which is just backslash C and then backslash careers. Uh, we're going to be growing the SEO team and really the growth team. Uh, we're hiring for everything actually. Uh, so if you see any roles, you're interested in working with me at Figma. You can reach out to me, uh, on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me on Twitter. I'm just at my name, full name, Tony Jemiel. Uh, and my email is just Tony, T O N I, uh, at figma.com. So drop me a note. Um, and you can also learn some more about me on my website, which I just dropped in. So would love to chat with anybody who's interested in joining Figma and helping me uh, grow this thing to be even bigger and better. Thank you, you know, all three of you. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Eli. On Tony's note, I, I was trying to help a client find new people to hire for their team. And at the same time, it's helping some of my friends who are laid off during the pandemic. So I have this huge list of people looking for roles and people that are hiring. So if anybody's looking for a new role or hiring, I want to just connect you. So reach out. What, what's the link to that? It's not. It's just find me on LinkedIn. And oh, it's, I, it's I, just fun. I, I, <laughs> EA and I said, I, I say, you put them on the list and then I'll match them. <laughs> Okay, perfect, perfect. Find Eli on uh, on LinkedIn. Um, and or shoot or a message. And... Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you all three of you. This was so fun. I mean, uh, it just uh, just a, a font of knowledge. Um, I thank you for being so generous with your time, uh, Eli. Tuning in from from the airport in Rhode Island, Brian in uh, in Portugal right now, and Tony in SF. Um, that thank you all three of you. I will I will catch you backstage. And um, yeah, we will be starting the, the next session in about five minutes. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks. See ya.